Hello, hello, hello. So today I am talking about the legendary actor, director, and activist, Sidney Poitier. Now, this is, I guess I can call it a series. <laughs> so I did one of these last year and that was with comedian and activist Dick Gregory with the same title, How a Black Man Died of Old Age. And I had every intention of doing a follow-up for Sydney Poitier last year, but things happened and I forgot to get back to it. So <laughs> here we are today talking about Mr. Poitier. I will be covering three moments in his life where he escaped a young man's demise. Sidney Poitier is one of the great actors of 20th century Hollywood. He was the first black man to win an Oscar for best actor. Some of his critically acclaimed films are Lilies of the Field, 1963, In the Heat of the Night, 1967, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, also in 1967. He also had a successful career as a director with films like Uptown Saturday Night, 1974, Stir Crazy in 1980, and Ghost Dad in 1990. But you may not know that Poitier endured some near-death incidents in his younger years that could have cut his acting career short. Could you imagine what the art of filmmaking would be like with the absence of his body of work? Hello, my name is Tamika, and whether you stumbled upon Junkie for a Story or are here by intention, thank you for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, please give it a like and subscribe by the end. Don't forget to click the bell for notifications so you don't miss out whenever I release new videos. I did gather a collection of articles from the internet to build this story, but I won't be putting links in the description since I have found that those links sometimes don't work. So I'll just leave it at that. I've used a number of different sources from People Magazine, Times Union, Hollywood Reporter, and different ones I will state when I am quoting them. And now back to the video. So, Sidney Poitier was known for making the kind of films that challenged both white and Black America at a time when racial injustice was constitutional. We're talking the 1960s. The Black Power Movement was on the rise and supporters of Malcolm X's approach to dealing with racist people may have viewed Poitier's portrayal of Black male characters as too reserved, given what they were faced with. But Poitier always knew what he was doing in the roles he chose. In a 1967 interview, Poitier said, the kind of Negro played on the screen was always negative, buffoons, clowns, shuffling butlers, really misfits. This was the kind, I'm sorry, this was the background when I came along 20 years ago and I chose not to be a party to the stereotyping. When he signed on to play Virgil Tibbs in the heat of the night, his main concern was where they would be shooting the film. Because of racial strife, especially in the South, he did not want to film in Mississippi, knowing that one of the scenes would have a black doctor slapping a white man would undoubtedly rile and provoke the public. Regardless of education, profession, familial link, black men were not equal to white men in those times. 
48 being an intelligent man who knew who he was and who America was, did not want to incite an already violent and tumultuous South. He asked, obviously, that the film be shot above the Mason-Dixon line. The director, Norman Jewison, who would become a close friend of Poitier's, considered his concerns and changed the location to Sparta, Illinois, but convinced Poitier to film two scenes in a small town in Tennessee, which was below the Mason-Dixon line. They were to spend only two days in Tennessee for the filming, and Jewison assured Poitier that he would not be alone and would be protected from protesters. So the group, they stayed in a Holiday Inn. That was the only hotel that would accept African-Americans. Jewison said, you've got to remember we were shooting in 1966. So things were a little uptight. Martin Luther King Jr. had just done the March on Selma. The country was in the midst of a racial revolution. If you could call it that, there were marches, there was a lot of friction between the races, and most of it was in the South. And this is what Jewison said in The Hollywood Reporter. So while staying at the Holiday Inn, local residents found out that they were there, and a group of pickup trucks showed up saying, well, I guess the men in the trucks were shouting and saying that we had women, I'm quoting, shouting and saying that we had women in there and stuff. And I guess they were taunting the crew to provoke them to come outside and we know what would have happened if that <laughs> took place. So Jewison, possibly regretting his decision to go below the Mason-Dixon line, he told Poitier, there was a little demonstration occurring outside. <laughs> but he assured the actor that things would be fine. Jewison recalled Poitier replying, I got a gun under my pillow and I'm going to blow away the first guy who comes through that door. Jewison understandably was panicked for multiple reasons, two of which were the fact that he potentially endangered his lead actor. Also, he was responsible for his entire crew who was staying at the hotel. If something happened to any of them, it would disrupt filming, among other things. So Jewison called his largest guys that he had with him to calm the rowdy crowd outside. Fortunately, everyone was left intact. No one got hurt. We take for granted how significant the art of filmmaking is. After filming wrapped, Jewison took his family on a skiing trip and his son broke his leg. So he took his son to the hospital, the local hospital there. While there, he ran into Attorney General Robert Kennedy, whose son also was being cared for, cared for with a broken leg. They began talking about the film and Bobby said, this could be a very important film, Norman. Timing is everything in politics and in art and in life itself. This is in The Hollywood Reporter. Jewison is talking about this conversation. And then when Jewison won the New York Film Critics Circle Award for Best Film, it was Robert Kennedy who presented him with the plaque. Okay, well, don't leave yet because I got 
two more stories to tell. So one of them is the time when Portier and Harry Belafonte almost got ran off the road by the Ku Klux Klan. But before I tell you that story, let me tell you about the time when when the teenage Portier was taught a valuable lesson about etiquette when approaching a white person's home in the 1940s South. Sidney Portier, being born in Miami, Florida, was nature and not intention on the part of his parents. His mother went into labor two months early when she and her husband, Portier's father, were selling fruits in the Magic City. His parents owned a tomato farm and would sell fruits, then return home to the Bahamas. Years later, Portier, as a teenager, returned to Miami to live with his older brother and their his family. He did menial jobs as a young man, and one day he was asked to deliver a package to an affluent home. It was custom that Black people leave packages at the door, but Portier, being from the Bahamas, wasn't aware of this way of doing things, so he knocked on the door. And this is the 1940s South. So this was a punishable offense. If committed by a Black man. The homeowner reported Portier's transgression to the local KKK chapter. When he and his brother learned he was wanted by the KKK, who were looking to teach him a lesson, Portier's brother put his younger brother on a bus to New York. This was told in the Times Union newspaper. Shortly after his arrival in the Big Apple, he was jailed for vagrancy and temporarily lived in an orphanage. He later enlisted in the U.S. Army, working with psychiatric patients before finding his true calling, acting. And then there was the time when Portier and actor Harry Belafonte nearly got killed trying to do a good deed. So the year was 1967. Portier was already a young and successful actor at this point. He had films like A Raisin in the Sun, Porgy and Bess, and The Defiant Ones on his resume. Harry Belafonte was a successful singer and actor at this point with songs Brown Skin Girl and Deo, the Banana Boat song. He also had some successful films, Carmen Jones and Island in the Sun to name a few. So so they both had successful careers at this point. But then one day, Poitier got a call from Belafonte, who he calls his brother. The singer, actor, and activist at this point was needing a favor unlike your typical favors, okay? (laughs) So just to give you a picture of what life was like in those days. The year before, NAACP field secretary Megger Evers was shot dead outside of his home by white supremacists. And then there were three civil rights workers, part of Freedom Summer Movement, who were abducted in Philadelphia, Mississippi, 
they were brutally beaten to death and lynched and left in shallow graves. The rising 60s were in full effect. This was the atmosphere when Belafonte asked Portier to drive with him through Mississippi to deliver $70,000 cash, most of it Belafonte's own money, in a black doctor's bag to fund the fight for civil rights in the Deep South. So, let me back up. The Council of Federated Organizations were strapped for cash. The cost of the operation and its to care for it, its volunteers across the state went beyond their capital. So in August, the de facto Secretary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, James Foreman, asked Belafonte for financial help. They needed $50,000 and needed it ASAP. Belafonte organized a quick fundraiser and donated most of his own money to raise a total of $70,000. Then the problem became how to transport the money to the SNCC. Belafonte couldn't wire the money because white supremacists controlled banks, gave people who assisted civil rights organizations trouble to negate civil rights efforts for Black Americans. So the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee already had trouble with people wiring large amounts of money, which is why they were in this predicament in the first place. Wiring money to any especially that large amount of money to any African-American was tantamount to suicide. So Belafonte concocted a desperate plan to fly from Newark to Jackson to meet Foreman and a SNCC volunteer named Willis Blue. Blue was to drive them to the SNCC headquarters in Greenwood to hand deliver the funds. Somehow, word got back to the Klan and other racist, or racist groups, and they followed them on their journey. Portier and Belafonte sat in the back seat of the nondescript small car, while Blue, Willis Blue, drove at 40 miles per hour to not risk getting stopped for speeding. Highway Patrol was known to hide out along the route to find reasons to stop black men and jail them so that they could brutally beat them. Almost immediately, their automobile was attacked by a pickup with two by fours mounted on the grill. The truck slammed into them repeatedly, trying to force the small car off the road. The cat and mouse game continued for several miles. At the final moment, a hastily convened procession of autos with SNCC volunteers arrived to form an impromptu protective convoy. Shots were fired at the two black celebrities, but they miraculously managed to escape them all. The caravan survived the near-death experience, and when Cordier and Belafonte exhausted and bruised, walked into the small Elks Hall in Greenwood. They were met by screams of joy and impromptu freedom songs by the volunteers. As told in the article on jalopnik.com. And Sidney Poitier went on to live to be 94 years old. In his career, he received many accolades, including the Academy Honorary Award for his Lifetime Achievement, the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom presented by him 
sorry, presented to him by then President Barack Obama. He passed away on January 6, 2022. A plethora of celebrities paid tribute to Mr. Portier's life and career. He was the example of what black men and black people in general aspired to be for a generation. And he is beloved by generations after. And that does it for this episode. How a Black Man Died of Old Age, Sidney Poitier. I do plan to do one for Mr. Harry Belafonte, who recently passed away. So look forward to that in the future. I won't, <laughs> I won't give you a date because I won't. But hopefully you enjoyed this installment. Like, comment, subscribe if you choose. And let me know what you think of the legendary Sidney Poitier's filmography. Or whatever you have to say about the leading man. All right, well, I will catch you in the next one. Thank you again for listening and watching. Bye.